All right, everybody, welcome to the Wednesday, October 2nd, 2024 meeting of the Community Preservation uh, Committee. Uh, as always, we start with general public comment. Uh, I am not seeing any general public out there. Sarah, are you? I see no general public. No general public. Well, actually, De Devin is technically general public. Devin, are you still general public or are you, um, do you want to speak to that? Are you joining us anytime soon? How is that going? Um, I imagine the clerk's office is really busy. So I don't know if if the council voted on it yet, but I'll, I'll let you know when I, when everything's in order. Great. Well, thank you for joining us. And it's, it will be nice uh, that you are coming to these meetings. If in fact, you're able to join us as an official committee member soon, you'll have that, that, um, those meetings uh, will, will be helpful. Approval of minutes. There are none. So there we can move. There are no. I need to catch up. Right through that. Uh, the chair's report, just a couple quick things. One is, uh, as folks will remember last or two weeks ago, we spent some time on the CPC plan. Uh, we are not voting on that tonight. Uh, Sarah's going to send that out or a link to that uh, in plenty of time for us to look at that for our next meeting. So for our October, the, what is it, 16th uh, meeting with applicants, uh, we will also attempt to fit that review of the CPC plan in. Sarah, do you think we'll have enough time to do both if applicant meetings and uh, do the CPC thing? Yeah, I mean, we've had the public hearing. So if anyone has questions or want any additional revisions, we could uh, we could bounce it to the next meeting. But it, it seemed like everyone was happy with it. So we will attempt to attempt to uh, to deal with that at that time. Um, site visits. Is that something that we need to be looking at now to often we have scheduled those before our meetings with applicants, or at least during our meetings with applicants? Is that yeah. something? Sure. So I, I sent out the applications. I no expectation that anyone has had time to review them yet. But even just looking at the titles might help you to think about um, whether a site visit would be helpful for any of those. Yeah, I'm thinking that in in my understanding of, of looking at it, it's really the JFK tennis courts and um, basketball court are certainly worth a visit to. I don't know if we quite need someone from the rec department to join us on that. It seems like something we could do on our own to look at the shape, the shape of those things. The pavilion at Grow Food, I mean, there's a space for it that we could be looking at. I don't know if we know need grow food to take us there either. Um, do folks have the, the Shepherd House um, project? I'm not, again, I don't know if we need any site visits. Do people feel strongly one way or the other on any of these? Does anyone feel the need to have staff or um, or project? Uh, folks accompanying us to any of these? I'm not seeing any nodding of heads. So it looks like maybe we don't need any site visits, Sarah. Uh, if folks feel differently, maybe contacting Sarah and she could try to set those up uh, for us and come up with, come up with times. Uh, okay, so that is the chair's report. Moving right along, tonight's uh, guest, and presenter, and really is the is the meeting is devoted to to Stuart. Um, hi, Stuart. Thank you for joining us. Uh, for those of you who don't or have not met Stuart, Stuart is the executive director of the statewide community preservation coalition. Um, Stuart, thank you so much for making time out of your busy schedule. I know we are we're one of a hundred plus CPCs out there, so the fact that you're giving us. 45 minutes of your time is much appreciated. We're turning the rest of the meeting over to you. And I think you have a PowerPoint. Yes. Uh, Sarah, are you able to? Yeah, I, I have the share the screen button. Um, Brian, if it's okay with you, before we do that, um, 
it's been a long time since I've been out in Northampton to one of your CPC meetings and a lot of the faces have changed. So I'm hoping maybe folks could introduce themselves and tell me what board or committee they're from, um, just so I can get to know everybody. Great, that makes sense, Stuart. Um, Kevin? Yes, hi, Stuart, I'm Kevin Lake. I'm the chair of uh, Northampton's Conservation Commission for the last, I don't know, 12, 14 years. Great. Chris Hellman? Uh, Stuart and I have met. Uh, yes, I, you're the, the other one, they're the one I recognize. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I'm one of the elected slots in Northampton. Great. Uh, Chris Tate? Hi, Stuart. I'm the planning board representative to CPC. Great. Jeff? Hi, Stuart. I was here the last time you came to visit us, too. I'm with the uh, representing the Northampton Housing Authority. Great. Nice to see you again, Jeff. Martha? Hi, Stuart. I also was here the last time um, you came. And uh, I am the chair of the Historical Commission, and I'm also the representative from the Historical Commission. Great. Lemmy? Hi, my name is Lemmy Coffin, and I'm an elected physician. Okay, hey, great. All right, Stuart, the floor is yours. Gotcha. All right, thanks so much. And um, I do appreciate your taking time out of your meeting to listen to the presentation and talk a little bit about the coalition. Um, the genesis of this meeting came last year when um, Sarah and Brian let me know that the committee wanted to have me come and do a short presentation and explain a little bit about us and what we do um, before you guys made a decision on whether to join the coalition. Um, so uh, that's where we decided that it would be a good idea for me to come and do a quick presentation. I do have a PowerPoint that I'm going to share and I am happy to, if it's okay with you, Brian, take questions along the way rather than waiting till the end. It makes more sense that way, I think, and folks can flow a little bit. So so feel free to just jump right in and maybe uh, Brian and Sarah, in case I don't see a hand raised, you can just let me know um, if someone has a question. So sharing the screen. Um, All right, well, let me start from the beginning. All right, so how do folks feel about that? Good view? Okay, I can see Martha and Brian's nodding and Martha's thumbs up and everyone else I can't see right now. So, all right, terrific. Um, so again, chime in along the way if you have you have questions as we work through the presentation. So as Brian said, I'm the director of the Community Preservation Coalition. I've been at the coalition for 18 years. Before that, um, I was chair of my CPC in my town. I live on the North Shore of um, Massachusetts uh, in a town, little town called Boxford. I was chair of my CPC for five years um, and then joined the coalition as the full-time executive director in 2006. And our organization, is a nonprofit, we're based in Boston, um, but we're really just a combobulation of all the other nonprofits that you see on the screen. Um, these organizations, which are split very nicely between uh, open space and recreation, historic preservation, and housing organizations all founded the coalition. And they founded us actually in, in uh, the early 90s. Um, and this organization, this coalition, was the ones who advocated for a decade at the state um, to get CPA passed. So it was this group, along with um, a legislator named Bob Durand, who came up with the idea for CPA, um, wrote the legislation with Bob, who filed it at the State House. Um, and it took about a, about a decade for the legislature to get comfortable with CPA and finally pass it in 2000. Um, and then uh, the, there were about 40 organizations in that loose association. And these six, um, uh, kicked in money and formed the coalition um, with a full-time staff. Before that, it was just all the volunteers. And um, they really felt, these organizations, that now that CPA had passed, nothing happens until the municipalities understand it and adopt it. So that was the main mission of our organization early on, was to go out and explain CPA and help folks understand it and then adopt it in their communities. 
Um, and we've really, I think, morphed completely as an organization. We do very little adoption work now. Uh, we answer questions, um, but we don't um, raise funds for campaigns anymore. We don't um, go out and the CPA um, is really well known now. And the local advocates are really excited about doing that work. So we really focus on the 196 cities and towns that already have CPA and making them um, extra efficient with use of their funds through education, training, and uh, advocacy. Um, the coalition has a steering committee of which uh, one member of each of these organizations is a part of. And then we have eight other members, sorry about that, eight other members that are from local CPCs, just like you. Um, so last time I came, um, uh, I brought Bob Wagner with us, who was our CPC representative from Hatfield. He was chair of the CPC there for a long time. Um, and then we have some seven at-large members as well um, that guide the coalition. And the things we do, I think, are, are very typical of a municipal trade association, for lack of a better term. So um, I forget who was the CONSCOM um, representative. I think that was, um, uh, who was that? Is that Chris? Were you the CONSCOM representative? No. Uh, Kevin, Kevin Lake. Kevin, okay. So Kevin, you have MACC, right? That you work with all the time, the Massachusetts Association of Conservation Commissions. And they provide very similar things to your conservation commission that we provide to CPCs. Um, and you pay a due to MA, dues to MACC to join. Um, and really every board or committee has an association that works on these statewide issues. You know, planning board, um, you know, MMA is the overall organization, Mass Municipal Association. There's a Massachusetts Tax Collectors Association, an Accountants Association, a Municipal Law Association. Really every board committee and staff department in, in a city or town has an organization like ours that works on their program. The difference for almost all of them is that there's a state agency that also works on that program. There is absolutely no one in the state of Massachusetts government that has CPA in their job title. They don't spend a penny on administration of the program. They leave it all to us as the nonprofit. Um, so, you know, if you're on the CONSCOM, you have EEA and you have a team of 50, 60, 70 people at EEA um, who administer all the conservation laws and grant programs and all those things in Massachusetts. Um, uh, but with CPA, there is no one. Um, and so that's why our organization, very often people will confuse us with a state agency and think we are because there is no state agency on, on CPA like there is for all the other different uh, boards and committees in town. I think the, the thing that folks know us for most is um, the first thing on the list there, there are technical assistance um, and our advocacy work. Um, particularly the advocacy work is not something that you're gonna be doing yourselves, right? You're probably not gonna, you know, I don't know if any of you have done this, but probably not, drive, drive in your car and go testify at a hearing at the state house um, or go visit with legislators who are voting on important legislation. And that's the work we do. It's no accident that our office is uh, two doors down from the state house because we're there an awful lot. Um, and we've always maintained an office in Boston that's been really close to the state house. That's the number one criteria for us. Um, we work a lot on ballot measures. So in fact, we worked very closely with um, the folks in Northampton, including Paul Spector, who was a city councilor back then to get CPA adopted. Um, and we actually donated money to Northampton from our campaign account. Um, to help you guys have uh, local funding to get CPA adopted. Um, and then we also work on any time uh, things happen with CPA along the way, um, changes to your bylaws or changes, uh, challenges to the program and that sort of thing. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and then we run uh, sessions like this that are workshops and training sessions. Uh, I just came back from Martha's Vineyard where we had an all island training session with six different CPCs there. We had about 60 people in the room. Um, and had a great workshop on CPA and a training that I presented there. Um, I've, I'm really traveling the state extensively in 2024 because with COVID, you know, we didn't get out as much as we like to. So um, we're doing a lot of visits, basically one a week, pretty much all year long. Some of them to individual CPCs. Um, a lot of them are regional presentations. We're going to Grafton in a couple of weeks, and we're going to have six towns all around Grafton in the room talking about CPA. 
uh, and learning and doing education. We support ourselves um, like any other nonprofit. Um, we apply for grants from foundations. Um, the six nonprofit partners provide a lot of in-kind and pro bono help for us. Um, but by and large, the biggest, by far the biggest um, funding source for us is membership dues that CPA communities pay to the coalition. It is a voluntary um, donation um, to be a jo joining uh, the member of the coalition. We're very, very lucky that 99.9% .9 of all cities and towns in the state um, join every year. Um, and that's what we're here, you know, to make you a little bit more comfortable with that tonight. And we and we hope the end result is that you will uh, join with all the others and become a member of the coalition again. Uh, the other thing that I think a lot of folks use and um, maybe don't realize that uh, the amount of effort that goes into putting this together, but our website is the only place you'll find information on CPA. Good luck finding anything about CPA on the state website. You'll find um, a, a, a spreadsheet of the payout of the trust fund on DOR's website, and that's about it. Whereas if you want to learn about conservation laws and grant programs and all the other things on conservation, EEA has hundreds of pages on their website. Um, and the uh, same thing with um, housing issues. You know, HLC has, you know, 400 people in their staff the different websites for all their different agencies, but there's nothing for CPA, which is why incredibly popular and, and uh, really heavily used on traffic, we can tell, uh, because it is the only source on CPA. And we spend a ton of time. We have pretty much a full-time employee that just works on making sure this website has every bit of information you might need uh, on CPA. I call attention to that technical assistance tab. You see the red arrow there pointing to that one? That's the section of the website that's for you. Um, that's for CPC members um, to really dig into technical assistance questions on CPA. And it opens up this large menu and there's really hundreds of articles um, on there on every single topic of CPA that you can think of um, that we've added to the website um, throughout the years. And we're constantly updating and providing new resources for communities. So if you haven't spent time on this technical assistance tab, I would encourage you to. Um, it's organized by category, so you can read about um, the, the best practices in the category that you're in. Um, I mentioned that CPA has been incredibly popular. Um, it's in 196 communities in the state out of the 351, so more than half the communities have it, but actually 70% of the population lives in a CPA community now uh, because we've gotten a lot of the cities to pass CPA recently. Uh, Springfield passed a few years ago. Worcester is starting this year. This is their first year in CPA. Um, of course, Boston passed in 2016. And um, most of the major cities at this point uh, they were latecomers to the game. They really weren't. Um, Northampton, I think, was a little bit ahead of the curve, which is terrific. Um, but the amount of cities that adopted in the first decade of CPA was not uh, nearly as many as the cities for the second decade of CPA. Um, it was in the early days, um, a few outlying cities like Northampton, Salem, and um, Peabody was early, and Newton was early. But by and large, it was a suburban and rural um uh, uh, activity that um, those kind of communities pass CPA. And now it's completely flipped to the blue collar urban uh, gateway cities that have passed CPA in the, in the second decade, which gives us a nice mix across the state. Um, you'd think that after 20 years, anyone who had interest in CPA would have already adopted. Um, it's just not proving to be the case. Um, it's, the program is so popular we have 11 communities voting on CPA this year. These folks all have ballot campaigns and they'll all be question six on the November ballot after the five statewide questions. And three of these communities actually um, went and got registered voters, the 5% of the registered voters to get on the ballot. Um, there's two methods to get on the ballot, either the town meeting or city council vote, um, or you can collect signatures and three of them actually went to the extensive effort to do that, which is, which is not easy. All right, so let's dig into um, some of the reasons why the coalition is working hard for you and why we feel that we're worthy of, of support and the other communities. Um, oh, we always start with the money because it is what makes the world go round and it's no different in the CPA world, honestly. Um, CPA has two revenue sources, your local revenue surcharge, of course, that's your 3% local surcharge that you passed 
and the voters approved in Northampton and the CPA trust fund distribution that is based on how much you collect in the local surcharge. So I wanna dig into these funding sources a little bit and show you the things that we're working on to enhance the funding for CPA. So let's start with the trust fund. Um, the, there are actually two sources of funding for the trust fund. The green is statutorily required. That's in the CPA legislation. It says the state is passing CPA. We're creating a new fee to fund a match to CPA communities. And they added a surcharge on top of every document filed at the registry of deeds anywhere in the state. So when you go to a registry of deeds and you um, record a document, whether it be your mortgage, a mortgage discharge, an order of conditions from the ComCom, um, uh, estate documents, whatever it is you're filing at the registry, you pay a fee. Um, and the fee varies depending upon the document. Um, and most of that fee goes to the state's general fund. But $50 off the top of every fee paid on every document filed at the registry goes directly from that registry window after people pay it, and it goes right to the Department of Revenue. And the only thing statutorily, <coughs> excuse me, they can do with that money is pay it out as a match to CPA communities on November 15th. That fee right now is $50. There's one document that's $25, municipal lien certificates, but all the rest are $50. So if it's $225 to record a mortgage in Massachusetts, $50 comes off the top and goes to our trust fund, 175 goes to the state's general fund. When CPA was first passed, those fees were actually 20 and 10. So all documents were $20 and municipal lien certificates were $10. And it was that way from 2000 all the way to 2019. The state will never approve automatic cost of living adjustments on any fees whatsoever. Um, so we had already lost in the 19 years um, that the $20 fee was in place. We had already lost about $9 of dollars just to inflation. So the trust fund was, you know, getting incredibly low. The pieces of the pie that were being paid out to communities were really low. Um, and so we started working on this in 2009. It took a decade to get the legislature to make a law that provides more money um, that's out of their control. And this money is out of their control. Um, is very, very difficult. Um, but we were finally successful in 2019 and got that fee raised from $20 to $50. That effort was, um, as you can imagine, um, hugely expensive and very extensive. Um, at the, at the, in the last year, um, as we made that final push and we saw that really we thought we could get it over the finish line, we had three different um, outside contract advocacy organizations um, working with us uh, in addition to our in-house staff. Um, so I, I'd probably say we spent well over half a million dollars um, on that 10-year effort, um, if not more, um, to get those fees raised on behalf of the CPA communities. Um, so that's the guaranteed part of CPA. During that time frame, when we were talking to the legislature and trying to get them to raise that fee, um, the trust fund just kept getting smaller and smaller. And so what the legislature said to us is we love CPA. Um, it's not quite right to raise the, the fee yet, but we'll start giving you some money from our state budget surplus. And believe it or not, the state has a budget surplus most years, not every year. Um, but that's in red because it's not automatic. It's not part of the statute. It's something that the coalition has to go and advocate for every single year. And there we're getting in line with every other constituency in the whole state that is trying to get a piece of the state budget. You know, that $50 billion budget, thousands of organizations and programs and state agencies are all advocating the legislature. It's about a six month process and we're in the mix every year to do that um, to see if we can get into the budget for um, state budget uh, surplus funding. And we've been very successful. Um, we've raised $120 million um, from that state budget surplus funding over the past uh, decade or so. All right, so let's dig into that 2019 legislation a little bit, that 10-year effort that we made to get the legislature to raise that fee 
and save the trust fund from falling into the single digits in terms of a match. Um, 2018 to 2019 was the last full year at the old fee structure when we were collecting uh, $20 on each document. And that brought in, in the final year of the old fee structure, $23 million to the trust fund, of which Northampton received a distribution that particular year of $217,000. So every year you get a check from the trust fund on November. It's collected at the registries in the previous year. Um, we did not include the state budget surplus in this analysis. We'll show you that separately. Um, so that was your final check under the old fee structure. Then the $50 fee kicked in. And in the first full year, because it kicked in mid-year, in the first full year, 20 to 21, the trust fund went from collecting $23 million to $82.5 million. So you can see the impact of that work um, over a decade that finally got passed. You can see what it did um, to the trust fund. And you can see what it did to your match you went from a $217,000 match in the last year of the old fee structure. When we got you the new fee structure and the first payout from that, your match tripled. It went to 600, more than tripled, went to $684,000. So you can see that was quite um, an accomplishment. We were really happy about that. Um, you know, it took a lot of work and a lot of money, but it was clearly worth it. Um, because you know, I told you approximately how much we spent on the advocacy effort, but it brought in, you know, um, you know, over fifty million dollars or so um, to all the CPA communities to be used on projects. So clearly, it was uh, more than worth the effort to do that, um, and we're really pleased that the new fee structure is now in place and providing a much higher match than it would have been um, otherwise. Any questions on that at all? And uh, Sarah and Brian, I can only see a couple of folks, so you're just going to have to let me know if someone raises their hand unless they pop to the top. All right. So um, there's been three full years of the new trust fund match. And so this chart tells you what you've received each year. Um, on the left-hand side, um, we saw that $684,000 match in 2021. The real estate market has been really sliding backwards as interest rates have been so high. You know there are very few homes for sale. Um, no one is refinancing at all. Who would refinance you know, now with interest rates high? Um, so the trust fund has been falling a little bit, um, but the match has still been pretty healthy for Northampton. You're at 3% and that helps. Um, you've uh, received 569,000 from that new fee structure and then another 433 in 2023. So it's about $1.7 million that your three matches have added to in the last three years. We did a calculation that showed what your match would have been had we not been successful and done that work to get the legislation passed at the state level. And your match would have been about $675,000. So you can see the impact that that work did in terms of providing more money to the Northampton CPA program of over a million dollars um, just in the last three years since we were successful. And of course, that's money you have now for um, projects and, and doing great things in your city. And the numbers are equally impressive for all the 196 communities all around the state who've also been the beneficiary of that work uh, to get more money to, into the program. Now, I mentioned there was a second funding source, right? Um, it took us a long time to convince the legislature. Um, nothing's easy up there. If any of you have been involved in legislation, uh, you've got to convince 200 different people. The people keep changing and the money's tight. Um, so it's hard. Um, so during that time frame, we asked the legislature to say, hey, if you're not going to raise the fee right now, how else can you help these communities? Because we don't want to see the match fall really low. If the match gets really low, communities start revoking CPA. No one has ever revoked CPA. Any community that has ever passed it has found the benefit the program to be incredibly beneficial. No one has ever revoked the program. Um, so uh, we didn't want to see that happen. We pushed the legislature hard, and they said, "Okay, what we'll do is we'll start giving you uh, money from the budget surplus at the end of the year, um, uh, if there is a, if there is a surplus. But every year we have to ask for that and get that written into the legislation. 
Um, and you can see on one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times, um, we've been successful in getting extra money from the surplus. And for Northampton, that money is added up to also close to a million dollars of additional funding um, that came to Northampton because of that advocacy effort that we did every single one of those years. Each one of those years, we had a six month effort to go up to the state house starting in January, right through when the budget was passed and signed usually in July um, and had to fight for that money. Um, a few years, we were not successful. Um, a few years, the state didn't have a budget surplus. So four of those years, um, you know, we did not get anything either because there was no surplus. We might have actually been in the budget. We might have been successful in getting them to give us 20 million. But then when it came down to the end, there wasn't 20 million in the surplus. So um, we've been successful far more than than not. Um, and there just hasn't been much of the surplus available um, in some of those years. Right now, there is definitely no surplus. If you've been reading, the state's in really tough shape financially. Last year, this year, definitely next year too. So it's going to be a little while before I think we see surplus funds again um, for the trust fund. Um, and truth be told, in all honesty, the surplus funds were really just designed to be a tide over to get us to the point where the legislature would agree on raising that fee. They did that in 2019, but we still were able to advocate for another $30 million in surplus funds after that fact. Um, but you know, the, this is definitely going to be a funny story. It's going to be more of a challenge in the future because they've already given us the fee increase and also the state's budget is in tough shape right now. Uh, but this has been very successful for all the CPA communities. So if you sort of add all that up, we wanted to give you an idea of, you know, your investment in our organization so we can afford to do that work. Obviously, as a nonprofit, the only way we can do that work is if the communities support us to do that and believe in us. Um, so we added up all the dues you've ever paid to the coalition actually adds up to fifty eight thousand eight hundred dollars. Um, you've skipped a couple of years along the way. Um, I think around 2018 was that last time the committee wanted to have me come out and do a presentation similar to this um, and then join the next year. Um, and then, of course, last year uh, you didn't pay as, as well as we waited for an opportunity to, to pull this meeting together. Um, if you add up the surplus funding that you've received from our work in that time frame and the trust fund uh, increase money from that $50 increase, it's almost $2 million. So I think the cost benefit ratio has been pretty good for your investment in us um, that what we've been able to provide uh, back to the communities. And this same equation would be the what every single community would see in terms of, of their investment in their dues and then what has been returned back in terms of the, the results of uh, what we've done. Any questions on that? All right, um, so we're moving along. There's not too much left, but I do want to give you a little perspective on the advocacy work that we do. So um, there have been, I think, a dozen or maybe 13 now changes to CPA over the years. And this is a list, which you can also read on our website, and, and you can click through to all the details of all these different pieces of legislation. This is all the times that CPA has been amended in a positive way. Um, and the coalition has been the main advocacy group getting all these bills passed at the legislature. So in this grouping of bills, for example, um, in the beginning of CPA, you couldn't fix up your historic buildings. You could preserve them. You could prevent them from injury, harm, or destruction in the future, but you couldn't rehabilitate them or bring them up to codes or anything like that. That was changed um, as a result of our work. That was the very first, way down the bottom, see chapter 165 of the Acts of 2002. That was the first ever amendment to CPA we worked on was to expand the historic category to allow rehabilitation of existing historic resources. Um, another one in here that you'll be very familiar with is the ability to rehabilitate parks, playgrounds, and athletic fields. That was not a part of the CPA legislation for the first dozen years. It wasn't possible until we advocated um, from 2007 to 2012. It took five years to get that piece of legislation done. And now, you know, the reason you have been able to spend so much money on your on your parks and um, and playgrounds and athletic fields and work um, has all been because of that change in 2012. Um, 
That was chapter 139 of the Acts of 2012, um, about three quarters of the way up. So that just gives you a couple of ideas of some of these changes. Um, in the historic category, um, Brian um, or Sarah, have you done any work on any historic artifacts or documents at all? Um, over time, either purchased them for the town, for the city? Uh, not, not for many years. Okay, but you have done it in the past. Uh, that wasn't an original part of CPA e uh, either. We we added historic document and artifact um, uh, work or to buy those artifacts um, uh, into the legislation as well. And there's some, been some really cool acquisitions that communities have done. Concord bought a musket that was in a private collection that was used in the Battle of Concord Green. Um, and it ended up in a private collection and they were able to buy it back and clean it up and put it on display at the library. Um, we've had a lot of communities buy you know, antique fire trucks from private there's, um, that were used in their city or town in the in the 30s or 40s um, and restore those. Lots of cool artifacts and document work has been done. We've had three copies of the Declaration of Independence um, uh, rehabilitated with, with CPA funds. So um, this goes on and on. We're not going to take the time to go through all these different changes to CPA, um, but these have all been beneficial, terrific changes that have allowed um, communities to be much more um, aggressive and um, flexible with their CPA funds. And the coalition has worked on each one of these. Uh, Stuart, I'll jump in on the question if yes. that's okay. You, you might cover it in the next slides, but just yeah. in case you don't. So it looks like the there hasn't been a change to the, the substance of CPA um, beyond the financial clarifications since 2012. So well, now that's a big the, one. Um, now that the housing market is changing and, you know, there's other issues going on, are are there other ideas afoot about how to oh, yeah. amend the CPA, pretend, you know, potentially to expand the types of affordable housing that would be able to be funded to ex uh, include additional income brackets or to allow the same type of uh, rehab and um, repairs to affordable housing that were amended for the recreational pieces? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so right over my right hand shoulder next to that bookcase is a folder you can't see because we're on board background here, but there's a pretty big thick folder with all the changes that we would like to make from CPA. And all those ideas have come from communities over the years. Um, you know, it, took, it, it takes at least five years to get a major piece of legislation passed like that. Usually you're into three sessions. You file it, um, you get it through committee the first session, um, and then the session ends and you start again from scratch. Um, and then usually you can get it through maybe one branch. Um, and then the session ends and you start from scratch again. And usually in the third session, if it's a big piece of legislation, that's the sweet spot. That's that's only if it passes. Sometimes it doesn't pass. So, um, you, you know, you can't do that every year in terms of major legislation like that, um, which is why you bunch things together and study them. And you really bring a bulletproof piece of legislation to the legislature. And that's what we're working on right now. In fact, we um, have a job description we're just about to post to expand our staff to hire a legislative director, a full-time legislative director, so that when we finalize all the changes um, that we'd like to do, um, we'll have a full-time legislative director to start working with the legislature on those changes. Um, housing will be a huge part of that. There are lots of things that need tweaking in CPA. Um, the... Um, you know, area-wide median income only going up to 100%. It's been that way for 23 years, but home values have far outstripped people's income in terms of increases. So we really need to raise the area-wide median income that CPA will support on, on housing um, projects, for example. Um, you folks have the first 100,000 exemption on your CPA program. You know, people which favors low income folks. If you have a house valued at $200,000, not too many of those left, right? Um, and you have the 100,000 exemption as part of your program, which most CPA communities do, um, someone's only gonna pay the, the CPA surcharge tax on $100,000 of their home, not 200,000. Um, that's the same $100,000 deduction that was in place in, in 2000 when the average home prices in Massachusetts was about $200,000. Now the average home price in Massachusetts is over 700,000 and we still only offer 100,000 um, for communities to exempt if they wanna exempt their low income 
folks from paying the CPA surcharge. So we'd like to give communities the flexibility to have a higher exemption um, than that if they want to. That would require local approval. Um, so there are a ton of different ideas we have. And the process, Sarah, will look like this. We're going to get our legislative director on board. Um, we're then going to uh, convene um, a working group of people from across the state that the legislative director will convene um, to get input onto ideas. Um, we will work with the legislature and, and potentially recruit sponsors. Um, we'll vet all the changes and do presentations. Um, you know, when we did that 2012 bill, I traveled around the state for about a year and a half explaining all the provisions of that bill um, to about, I think I did about 70 presentations on that bill. Um, and, um, and then we'll file it at the legislature and then begin trying to convince them um, that it's a good, uh, good thing. So yes, to your question, absolutely. It's, it's uh, a hot topic right now and something that I think we'll be investing significant amount of time, effort, and money in over the coming uh, few years. Did that answer the question, Sarah? It, yeah, it did. Thank you. Great. All right. Uh, Stuart, a, a quick question on the $100,000 exception. <clears throat> Excuse yes. me, exemption. So you're, you're, that, that's something that, that, um, that we talked about in our committee. And, and when we get opposition, of course, to our CPC, it's generally by lower income folks reeling from property taxes. Um, is that, is that uh, giving local control to raise that $100,000 exception? Is that currently a campaign that you're working on with legislators? No, that'll be in the new piece of legislation that we file. Um, but Brian, I think, do you folks have the low and moderate income exemption? I don't think you do. Sarah? Uh, we we do. We, we should. You have both the, the moderate and the low income? I believe we do. Okay. Um, actually, I can look that up if you'll bear with me right now for a second. Please um, do. Let's see. You passed CPA on November 8th, 2005. You implemented it in 2007, 3% surcharge. You do not. Oh, yes, you do. Low income and first 100,000 residential. The exemption you don't have, I knew you were missing one, is the first 100,000 commercial. So this was not part of the CPA legislation in the beginning. This is another one of the changes we made over the years. Um, in the same way that the first 100,000 residential exemption helps folks who have a low of value home from not paying a lot of the surcharge, the low income commercial exemption helps small businesses. So if you own a small repair garage, auto repair garage, and your building is worth $310,000, um, you know, right now you pay the CPA surcharge on $310,000 of your building. Um, if you were, if you were to adopt in Northampton the first hundred thousand commercial exemption value, that person, that small business, would only pay the surcharge on two hundred ten thousand. The same way low income folks uh, or low value homes only pay it on um, after that exemption. So that might be something in the interim, Brian, that you can consider to help at least small businesses in town, um, in the city. Um, most communities. Every new community that has passed CPA since 2012 has added that first 100,000 um, small business exemption. Every city since then, and most of the cities that passed CPA after you, all have it. Um, and no one passes CPA these days without also giving the exemption for the low, um, low uh, businesses. So that would be one tax relief thing that you could do right now. Um, and the city council would have to pass that and then it would have to go to the ballot. It would cut your CPA income, you know, a little bit. It would eat into your local surcharge, not by much, but it would, you know, and we can model that for you too, Brian. Um, we can and try to give you a nice idea. Stuart, that was something that would need to be voted on by, yes. by Northampton residents. Yeah, anytime you change anything about your CPA program, if you change your surcharge up or down, um, you can't go up because you're already at 3%, which is the maximum. But if you change your surcharge um, or your exemptions or revocation or adoption, they all require the same process, a two-step vote, city council approval, um, 
and they put it on the ballot and then the ballot election. Um, Great. Thank you for clarifying that. Story. Yeah, I could not see a ballot election to cut people's taxes failing, um, probably. I think you'd be pretty successful. I don't think it would be a heavy lift to pass that. And it would be a nice benefit for small businesses, and it wouldn't be a huge hit on your CPA program. Um, and then as we work with the legislature to see if we can get them to raise the residential exemption, Brian, um, that would help folks, you know, you know, maybe we'll double it to 200,000 or something like that. We'll have to, you know, see what people are comfortable with. Um, but um, that's something we definitely feel should be an option for communities. You don't have to do it, right? You could stay at the 100,000, but we really think that that should be higher now because home values have gone up so dramatically since the beginning of time. Um, the other thing I would encourage you, Brian, on this particular topic is um, uh, when people talk to you about CPA and they do, you know, feel it's a little bit of a burden, I would really help them, you know, and a lot of CPCs take this work and do a lot of this, helping folks figure out how to file that paperwork to be fully exempt from the surcharge. You know, you have that low income exemption. Um, a lot of CPCs publish flyers. We have examples on our website that promote, hey, you know, if you are, you know, um, of limited means and, you know, need a break on your CPA surcharge, here's how to do it. You know, we so there's example flyers on our website that a lot of communities publish. Um, we've had CPCs go to the Council on Aging and do a presentation at one of their meetings and saying, hey, anyone on a fixed income? Did you know you could apply to be exempt from the CPA surcharge? Here's the forms. We'll pass it out. Um, and you can use administrative funds to pay for that, you know, brochure um, and put a stack of them at the assessor's office when people come to pay their, their taxes. Yeah, we, we do work closely with the assessor's office right. um, because people are uh, especially concerned about water and sewer rates and the, the income limits are the same in Northampton. So when people come in to inquire about that, then they'll work with them on the... Uh, CPA exemption as well. Right. But that's a one way. That's someone who comes in, you know, to ask a question on their taxes or pay their taxes or whatever. A lot of CPCs, what I'm saying, are proactive and go out to the community and do presentations um, and um, and make sure those applications are spread around and, and brochures that explain it all and provide assistance to folks too. So um, we've had other communities, um, CPCs go to their council on aging and kind of train the staff there, you know, maybe alongside the assessors on how they can help senior citizens fill out those forms. Um, because sometimes it's daunting, you know, to fill out th that exemption form. I, I I would like to say the state made it easy, but it's a it's a it's a four page form, you know, that the state requires to get that um, low income um, exemption. So, um, you know, a lot of times Council on Aging's have, um, we had our statewide conference at your Council on Aging building, actually. You have a beautiful Council on Aging. Um, and a lot of times CPCs are very proactive in getting brochures and training for the Council on Aging to, so they can assist their uh, fixed income seniors. So we've been talking about legislation that's been beneficial, and that's a huge effort of the coalition and a lot of the work we do. But there's a second part of our legislative work, which we don't talk about very much at all um, on purpose. And that is the defensive work. Um, what you're looking at is a list of bills that were filed this session on CPA um, by different legislators, some of them by request from people in their districts who are not fans of CPA or not everyone wants to pay taxes for the greater good. We've never had a CPA election pass 100% to nothing. Um, we've had as high as 76%, but never 100%. Um, and these bills would all amend CPA in a way that would not be beneficial to the existing community um, or are amendments that might be a I good idea, but terrible execution. Um, and so, you know, every session we have to go through all 6,000 bills that are filed and sort through them all and pick out all the ones on CPA. And there's usually, you know, up to two or three dozen bills every session. Um, and then we have to follow those bills along, put them on a tracking sheet. We have to go testify at hearings. And then we have to go meet with the sponsors of each of those legislations um, and, um, and then uh, uh, possibly write letters um, and do a lot of work um, to educate the legislature on why this legislation would not be something that's supported by um, existing CPA communities and is good for CPA. You know, for example, there's one bill in here that would say, 
um, you would have to revote CPA every five years. You'd have to go back to the ballot every five years um, uh, to to re up CPA, which obviously would not be good. <laughs> um, you know, to you wouldn't be able to do any law. Really, it would be very difficult to bond for future projects, which I'm sure you've done. You know, if every five years you knew you had to go reauthorize CPA at the ballot. Um, so that's a lot of our uh, advocacy work, too. You will not see articles about this in our newsletter. You know, we're not, um, you know, uh, trumpeting this work. It's really behind the scenes work. It's part of the legislative process, part of how the sausage is made, they say, up on Beacon Hill. Um, but it's very much a lot of the time we spend is is on this aspect of our work, too. Not my favorite type of work, um, but it's necessary and, and should be done. Um, the other things that we've done for Northampton over the years, I've alluded to a little bit, um, but we've worked with your community since the very beginning. I mean, I, I found this press release or Chase found this press release from 2003 when you folks were first thinking about CPA. Chris Sicardi, who was the associate director of the coalition, um, came out to Northampton and did a, a presentation at that point. Um, and then I know we gave the campaign $2,500 to help uh, print signs and do brochures and um, newspaper ads and things like that to help CPA get passed um, in, in 2005. And then um, again, this is some uh, of the different things that we've done um, over the years. Um, we again sprung into action. Um, are all of you aware that CPA was actually on the ballot to be revoked in Northampton? Um, some of you who are new to the CPC might not even know that. But there's only been three communities in the entire state um, up until this year. There was one more this year, so it's four total that have ever had CPA revocation on the ballot. And Northampton is one of them. Um, the others are Sturbridge and Hingham and uh, then Groveland this year. Um, and in all four cases, you know, the first call a panicked CPC made was to us and said, hey, someone just filed the petition to revoke CPA. What do we do? Um, and we've got a whole, you know, jumping into action, um, you know, um, all hands on deck approach to communities that are challenged that way if they ask for help, which all of them do, um, to help uh, defeat that effort. Um, and um, during that challenge, um, we had we had a campaign account back then when we used to do a lot more campaign work. I think we donated another two thousand dollars to the uh, campaign to defeat that ballot question and worked really co closely with um uh, George Cahoot, or is that my pronouncing? Anyone know George? Am I pronouncing his name right? Yeah, George led that campaign. Um, so we worked right alongside George very closely with uh, both our time and money um, to save the CPA co program from revocation. And I'm, I'm proud to say that all four times we've been successful um, by a wide margin. It's usually our 60, 70% vote at least to keep CPA because folks are so, so happy with it. Um, but you can't take it for granted, for sure. Um, the revenue piece we've talked about, all the work we've done on revenue and the advocacy work. Um, and then we haven't talked much about our technical assistance. You folks are very lucky that you have a full-time CPA um, administrator um, who's been you know, working on CPA for a long, long time and has got a ton of ex experience. So this is not going to be um, something that you're going to use as much as some other communities. But I will tell you that you know, Jack Horner, the first chair, and Fran Volkman and Catherine Baker, all the past chairs, um, used us extensively in the first decade that you had CPA um, to get things up and running with technical assistance. Um, and we still take, you know, calls all the time from, um, the, you know, the Valley CDC calls all the time with questions when they do projects in, um, in Northampton. Um, and um, uh, we get uh, calls from citizens. We'll, we'll answer questions on CPA from anyone. If a community is a member community, we feel like everyone in, this, in the community has access to our technical assistance. So we take calls from residents, town councils, city solicitors, municipal officials, anyone who's got a question on CPA. If that community is a member of the coalition, which like I said, 99.9% .9 are, um, we, will, we will help them. And then we talked about our website as well, which is an offering we provide that does take a good bit of effort and, and money um, and time to keep active. Um, we've added some great data bank features recently um, to our website where, where we've sliced and diced the numbers on your program a million different ways. Um, we also maintain that statewide CPA database that's collected 
by the state. Um, so there's a lot of information on, on that website that I think will be beneficial to all of you. So that's the presentation I have for you tonight. Um, you know, hopefully I've convinced you that membership in the coalition is, is worth it and um, that we're working very hard on your behalf, um, but we can only do that with, with your support. So we very much hope that um, the community, the CPC will vote to join. You pay your, for those of you that don't know, um, uh, administrative funds are available. We have a letter from DOR that um, clarifies that administrative funds absolutely can be used to pay membership dues. Um, and in fact, you do that to all the different associations. You pay MMA every year, MACC, um, all those different organizations um, have membership due structures that come out of the administrative account, usually of the committee um, that that program is aimed at. Um, so we'll send you, um, Brian and Sarah, I'll send you an invitation to join the coalition for FY25. Um, we're just beginning our new, our new fiscal year. And um, we hope you will support us and join us and, and work alongside us. <clears throat> Thank you, Stuart. It's very, very informative. And I, uh, speaking for all committee members, appreciate that your time and your expertise. Before you leave us, um, maybe you can get out of your screen share yep. so you can see all of our faces okay. again. That might be, there unless people want to go back to certain slides, I guess. Does anyone have specific questions for Stuart while we still have him? Uh, Martha. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, that was excellent to get the update. And um, of course, we all appreciate the work that you do so much. Um, I recall, I think it was after the last presentation or maybe a few years later, um, we internally had a discussion about the fee structure. And my memory is that um, it was a tiered structure. Um, and I, I, we had a long conversation about this, um, you know, whether it seemed, and let me put it more frankly, it seemed as though the tiered structure was just a, uh, not to the advantage of um, communities that did not have as much money in their CPA fund budget. Um, and I think that we had suggested, and I believe Sarah conveyed this to you, that um, the, the coalition look at possibly something that was a little more scaled towards the revenues that the di different revenue levels that community ha communities have. And I just wondered if you had looked at that at all or your structure had changed at all since we last discussed it. Okay. Um, our structure is actually a very much a tiered structure. Um, and it's always been that way. We've never changed those tiers um, in, since we lost our, uh, launched our membership program in 2007. But there are, I think, 10 different tiers of dues. Um, so if you, and it's based on how much money you raise from CPA, how big your program is, right? It has nothing to do with the size of your city. You know, um, Springfield gets a lot less CPA money from the town of Lexington, like a quarter as much in the city of Springfield because of the way they adopted CPA. So it's just based on the amount of money that you raise locally for CPA. And that puts you into one of 10 categories. So like, for example, um, the smallest communities are, you know, zero up to $100,000, you know, and their dues, I think, are $300, right? Because they have a small program, they pay a small amount. It scales all the way up to Boston, who has $27 million in CPA revenue, um, and they're in uh, Stuart, you've frozen. Uh, we're not here. The local you. revenue is in a range that makes it the same for everyone. So Gosnold's percentage is very similar. It's in a range of, I think, 0.03 one-hundredths of 1% 1 to 7 one-hundredths of 1%, 1 something like that. Everyone pays the same percentage of what they raise in dues. Now, it's not perfect because you might be, you know, um, in a category of local revenue between two and four million or something. And if your local revenue is 2.1, well, your dues are gonna be a little higher as a percentage of your revenue than they would be if your revenue was 3.9, right? So there's only so much you can do without having 
individual dues for every single community, which would be a tremendous administrative burden. Um, but I will tell you, we have only raised since 2007, raised our dues once. And it was like a decade ago. Um, and very honestly, what gives us the ability to do that, Martha, and not raise our dues, and we do not, I cannot see us raising our dues again in the near future, is that we still have new communities adopting CPA, right? And those communities always join. We we are, you know, we will, we were nine for nine in the last group of communities that joined. Everyone joins. Um, they really all understand the value that we bring to setting up their CPA program, especially in the beginning. Um, and so that has allowed us not to raise the dues on the existing community, except that one time when there was a little bit of lull. Um, now, at some point in the future, we're going to run out of communities, right? Um, you know, we'll, we'll, if we have 250 communities, we might have to raise our staff to four or five people instead of three. Um, but we keep trying to raise the level of services that we offer and the number of people working on your behalf um, and the outside contract work we help. But it very much is tiered. And every community pays within a range, a very tight range of that. There is a chart on our website, Martha, that shows you each of the categories and the dues. We send that in our annual report when we send the dues um, renewal notice. So you guys got that last year around this time when we when we sent that. Yeah, I think you've answered my question. I My memory is that the, the tiers were much, um, there were fewer of them, but I also may not be remembering this accurately. And Brian yeah. and I, Jeff. I remember, I remember that conversation because you had that conversation locally and your decision was to pay $1,500 instead of the 3,500 that the tier was or whatever it was. I forget what it was, but I, I remember the $1,500 figure. I don't remember exactly what your, what tier you were in then. And you just sent us a check for $1,500. And when we called and said, you know, um, we just got a check, but it's not for the invoice amount or for the dues amount, um, we finally got an answer that the committee felt, you know, that's what it was worth. Um, and so we had a long discussion about that as well at our steering committee. Um, we had 21 people and we talked about Northampton, you know, extensively. Um, and the decision was made by our steering committee to return that check to you, which we did, um, because no community, you know, we want every community to be paying the same. You know, everyone should be is getting an equal benefit from all that work we do, particularly at the legislature and more money. And so we felt it was really unfair to, you know, start negotiating and cut deals for communities. Um, and also we have a budget, you know, we base, we're a nonprofit, so we're not making a profit. You know, we base what services we can offer on our budget. Um, and so so that's one of the years I think you didn't were on that list, 2018, that you didn't join um, because, um, you know, the the dues weren't what you sent was not your actual dues. Um, and then I think that might have led to me coming out. Folks asked me to come out and then you meet the committee immediately afterwards said, no, we get it. We just didn't really understand exactly what we were doing. We had a lot of new folks at the time. And um, and then you joined again. Okay. Up and, right. up and Thank you. I think you've answered my question. Yeah. Uh, Chris Hellman. Hi, Chris. Hello. Um, thanks for the presentation, Stuart. And um, I actually had uh, I, I I took I took some time earlier this year when you offered um, boot camp for for new CPA members. Um, I hadn't done it before, and I thought it'd be um, useful. It was some good information, and. Um, it got me thinking about as part of your um, Beacon Hill advocacy, um, do you do outreach particularly to new members, but also just to members generally um, talking not specifically about legislation, something like that, but but like an orientation program for for Beacon Hill members and staff? Um, and, and part and part of the reason I asked this is um, I, I was uh, intrigued by the the sort of um, the list of legislation uh, that that you look at that that's potentially detrimental to you know the CPA in communities. Um, it seems to me that um, while they while members may do it at the behest of constituents, no member is going to introduce a bill that they don't support. 
which means there are members on 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 Beacon Hill who are not supportive of the CPA for whatever reasons. And I was just wondering if you do some sort of proactive work to sort of sell the CPA story um, on Beacon Hill, absent you know a, a specific agenda. Yeah. So to correct one thing you said, legislators file legislation that they don't support all the time, all the time. It's called by request. Um, it's a code word that they give to each other to indicate that the legislature doesn't support it. So it'll be name, it'll look like just another bill, it'll be filed by the legislator, but then in parentheses it says by request. And that's code word, like I said, that I was requested to do this but I didn't do it willingly and I don't support it. Happens all the time. And a couple of those bills on there are by request bills. Um, and so we go to the legislature and the legislator says, I don't support that, you know, but if constituents ask me to file legislation, I will file for them. That's my job, to file legislation on behalf of constituents. So happens all the time. Um, um, but to answer your main question about um, legislators, we, we definitely do um, in January, every two years, when the legislature is seated, we actually don't convene one big meeting because we, they won't come. We go see them individually. Now, I will admit to you that COVID made that very difficult the last two sessions, really difficult. Um, but before that, um, you know, we always would meet with every new legislator starting in January. It usually takes a couple of months. January and February are actually good times to go get legislators because nothing happens at the legislature. They file their bills, and then there's like a six-week period where they're all waiting for committee assignments, and all the bills are getting assigned to committee, and they're moving offices around the building. And there's a good six weeks where the legislature really does not do much while they're waiting to get themselves organized for the session. It's, but it's a great time to go visit legislators. Um, when new legislators come in, one of the nice things about it is they don't have an office right away. Like I said, it takes about two months for them to move all the offices around based on committee assignments. So they put all the legislators in what's called a bullpen. Um, and it's a conference room where the legislator uses that as their office for the first two months. And it's great for us as advocates because you can walk right into the conference room and walk right up to the desk of a legislator who's sitting there. You know, there's no receptionist, there's no, you know, closed door office. And so the access to new legislators in that first two months is really terrific. Um, and they're usually excited to talk to you because they want to learn, you know, they're like sponges. Um, they're brand new and they really want to learn. And when you call and tell them, you know, you have six communities in your district that have CPA, and I wanna show you the information. And we bring printouts of the projects and show them all the data on what their communities are doing. That's really valuable information to them. So it's a, it's a nice, it, it works both ways um, in those meetings. Um, so we will definitely do that again. And by January, we'll have our, our legislative director on, on board. So there'll be two of us doing that work. Um, and, um, and it's important also because every year people who we built relationships with are leaving. You know, Sarah Peak has one, been one of our huge supporters, um, assistant majority leader, a great legislator, totally committed to environmental issues and affordable housing. She lives in Provincetown. So housing's a huge issue out there. And she just resigned, um, taking a job in the administration. Um, and we had a, I mean, Sarah was one of the legislators who would give me her cell phone. And I could call Sarah on the phone. Um, so you lose that relationship. You have to meet the new person and start from scratch um, because eventually that new person will end up being majority leader, you know, or assistant majority leader. So the new people are a big focus for us. It's really important. Um, and you had, you know, some new folks a few years ago, you know, um, Representative Sabadosa um, and Senator Comerford out your way. Um, I don't know if they both represent um, Northampton or not. But um, they both do. Yeah, those are your two. That's what I had a feeling. Um, you know, we've gotten very close with both of them. Senator Comerford, um, in fact, um, filed an amendment to the Senate budget this year for us. I actually didn't talk about this. Um, we did attempt to get um, funding again this year in the state budget. And um, um, we were successful in the state Senate. We got $50 million. You probably read about this on our newsletters. 
we got $50 million um, in the Senate budget for CPA. They wanted it targeted specifically toward housing programs. That was the only way they would give us the money. We would prefer that any funding, like all the surplus money we've got, be in general, and then the communities get to decide what's important to their community and what they use it for. But the legislature wouldn't didn't want to do it that way this time. They really wanted to target housing, and that is that is a tremendous problem in the Commonwealth. Um, and it was um, um, Senator Comerford who who filed an amendment to that to help us get that. Um, so we worked really closely. She's probably our biggest champion in the Senate right now, Senator Comerford. Um, and um, unfortunately, it did not survive conference. Um, you know, the bill that they were working on, it was the housing bond. It wasn't the budget. I'm so sorry. It was the housing bond bill, the Affordable Homes Act. Um, and that bill came out a lot, came out of conference a lot skinnier than it went into conference. Um, so a lot of the things that just the Senate did or just the House did, they didn't survive conference. So unfortunately, we didn't get that get that funding. But again, Senator Comerford was really intricately involved with um, that effort. Um, let me. Thank, I just want to say, uh, sorry. Thank. Um, <coughs> I'm coughing here. Thank you, Stuart. Appreciate it. Yeah. Great. Hi, Lemmy. Hi. Um, you may have just answered my question, but I was, I guess, I was sort of curious about. Like if you guys are, so it sounds like you sort of piecemeal year by year pursue other revenue streams besides the main two that you talked about. Like, I guess in terms of long-term vision for CPA funding, like, do you see yourself, like, are there other sort of constant revenue streams you're hoping for, or are you just sort of working out, like whenever there's a bill that comes out, you try to kind of tack some CPA funding onto them. No, we, we actually don't do it that way. Um, okay. I'm kind of confused. We, we, like I was, I thought I understood. And then just now your comment about that one bill confused me. So yeah, well, no, that, that was the first time we had ever gotten any revenue source other than just those two, the surplus funds and the, the statutory revenue source. But that conversation started because we asked for more surplus funds. And they said, well, surplus funds go into the general account of all the CPA communities. We really want to come up with a program you know, to just goose up the housing efforts, basically. Um, and so they turned us down in the budget for more surplus funds, but said, we're about to do the Affordable Homes Act. Let's continue talking. And that's what we we're able to come up with. So that's the first time that's ever happened, actually. Um, so you ask a great question, Lenny, because am I saying your name right? Um, because there's only so far I think we can go on those fees at the registry. $50. I mean, that's, you know, that was a 20 to $50 increase. That was incredible that we got. That's, you know, more, that's two and a half time increase on that fee. So, you know, we were very cognizant of the fact that that's a big increase, you know, now the legislature had gone 19 years, not, not adjusting it. Right. So that's why the increase had to be so large to get us back to even really, but it still was a big increase, you know, and so that was only five years ago. So now the trust fund is in. Um, CPA continues to be popular, but more importantly, the housing market continues to really struggle. Um, can we go back and ask for even a higher fee? And I think the answer is right now, no, right? There's only so far you can go on, on different fees. So what other funding sources are available, right? Well, that's a $64,000 question that every single advocacy organization is asking themselves. Um, um, there is something called the deeds excise tax, which is the other piece of what you pay at the registry when you sell or buy a home. Um, that would be a nice funding force for CPA. Um, a lot of other folks think it would be a nice funding source for their programs as well. Um, I think probably the leading candidate right now, um, because we don't want to wait to go back to the legislature and get this conversation going because it's going to take, you know, a few sessions, right? Um, so we don't want to wait until the time is right to raise the $50 fee again. That might not be for five or 10 years. So I think the leading candidate now um, is probably the next session. There is an environmental bond bill that's going to pass. And to get CPA funding in the environmental bond bill is probably the leading candidate. Now, that could be a little awkward because... That only covers the um, 
uh, the environmental bond bill is designed to help conservation issues and recreational issues. And that's only two of the four categories of CPA. Um, but we want the money to be able to go into the general CPA account and let communities decide how to do it. So um, that may have to be combined with something else to give both sides of the equation. But that's the leading indicate that's the leading idea right now because we have such strong support. CPA is the number one funding source for buying conservation land and building parks and playgrounds in Massachusetts. Nothing else even comes close. The state grant programs are a tiny fraction of what CPA communities spend. And so our strongest constituency, um, you know, a very strong constituency for us is those categories. Um, but that's a tough question, you know? Everyone's asking themselves that question. I don't have a perfect answer for you, Emmy, but that's our thinking anyways at this point. Um, by the way, Lemmy, are you the elected, one of the elected members? Do you know that you're one of the very few elected members in the whole state? Um, there are only 11 communities out of the 190 that have elected CPC members like Northampton does. And some of them, it's not all four. Some of them, they appoint two and they elect two. So um, 11, you know, there's maybe 25 elected CPC members in the whole state, roughly. Um, so you're in a... Um, a small group. I remember the, didn't you switch to that? That wasn't part of your original. Did you switch to that at some point? Yeah, and not, not since I've been. All right. So it was in 2007. That, right. So I remember the first elected folks, right? I might ever yes. saw a campaign sign for a CPC member was uh, Lily's. Um, uh, what's Lily's last name? Lombard. Yes. Lily Lombard's sign. I was driving in Northampton. I had been at a meeting with the CPC or with um, one of the municipal officials or one of the nonprofits or a tour. I don't remember why I was there, but it was on CPA business. And I drove down and I saw a Lily Lombard for CPA committee sign. And I just almost crashed my car. I was like, oh my God, I have never seen a CPA campaign sign um, for an elected seat on the CPC. It's so rare. And I actually turned around and went and took a picture of it, which I still have. Um, and I, I sent it, I didn't know Lily at the time, but it started a great friendship, um, when she was successful and then went on to the, um, to the farm and the community supported agriculture and the community gardens and all that, that she worked on so, so hard. So thank so, you for running. So Chris, and let me put that on your resume. One of only 11, was it 12? 11 or? cities and towns, 11 only 11 of them have elected. There you go. Um, uh, you might see another one right now. Um, Lancaster is going to the ballot to um, uh, change their uh, change their bylaw, rather not going to the ballot to um, have elected members. Other questions for Stuart? Jeff. Hi, Jeff. Hey, Stuart. <clears throat> um, thank you for your presentation. Um, with this new. Um, legislative director is there any kind of um plan coordination with the cpc committees around the state and i ask that because um i work for a labor union and we're dealing with the state house all the time and the uh, mass um, state fed and we desperately need all the legislative um liaisons we can get because out here in Western Mass, I can't possibly keep up with with what's going on. But one of the one of the ways we coordinate with them is we're able to support um, legislation or help derail legislation that's not friendly to um, organized labor. And it's like I'd love to know that that slide you put up who who uh, filed those bills that did not file them by request, right? Um, that would be very, very interesting to know. And we do testify from time to time on on various bills. So I'm curious about that. But um, the other thing is, um, I don't know if you tr you folks track this or not, but are you, are you sensing a growing trend of um, municipal government trying to foist um, partial funding of what might otherwise be called um, regular maintenance? Um, you cut um, out there in the last, you cut out in that last question, do you see municipalities and then you cut out for a second? Sure. Uh, 
do you are you able to track or do you, are you aware of municipalities trying to shift the financial burden of what might otherwise be called regular municipal maintenance operations onto um, CPCs around the state as as not a not a replacement, but it, at least to partially fund their operations. Okay, so um, let's let's deal with that one first, and then I'll get back to your statewide advocacy question because it's a great one. Um, I'm assuming you mean um, there, there's two ways communities could be trying to grab some CPA money for the general fund. Um, one would be to change the legislation to you know specify that you know maintenance would be an allowable expense or something like that. Um, the other would be to be very aggressive at about submitting applications to the CPC for municipal projects that probably should be done by another budget in town, but you know we can find a way to sneak it through and justify it. And so we're going to go for it. Um, um, the first, I do not see any effort. I, there's no effort on the part of municipalities to change the legislation to make it more favorable to CPA funds flowing to general fund projects. There's a firewall between the general fund and the CPA fund. They are two separate funding sources. There's language in CPA that prohibits CPA funds from ever going into the and reimbursing or supplanting general fund spending. And that's kind of a sacred cow with CPA. The legislature was really careful to set that up. They would never agree to do that. And I don't see the municipalities even asking for that. Um, what I do see, Jeff, and I'm seeing it more and more and more as times are getting tougher for cities and towns, is coming to CPA and asking for funding for things that might be not the best of CPA projects, right? There's core CPA projects. There's no question. If there's a piece of conservation land that you'd love to buy or a playground that needs to be re uh, rehabilitated or a CDC that wants to build 60 units of affordable housing and needs some help, those are solid. That's what CPA is for, right? But then there's projects that, you know, are on the periphery or maybe on the gray area or maybe just over the edge of the line on the gray area, right? And this is all subject to interpretation. Um, and the municipal lawyers all work for the administration, not for you. Um, so um, I'm seeing tremendous pressures from municipalities to be much more aggressive about applying for CPA funds um, for things that they would not have applied for in the past that wouldn't be really bullseye CPA projects. Um, uh, a, tremendous increase in that. Um, and honestly, um, my wife jokes with me all the time that she hears me sometimes doing these technical assistance calls because, you know, now we, most of us work from home a lot more. Um, and she, one time she got off the phone, she said, you really need to be a, like a, a therapist as well as a CPA expert, because I get those calls from CPCs, like, how are we going to, you know, we have a town manager and look what he's planning to do. You know, I have a call tomorrow with a Cape community with the chair and vice chair, and it's all about the pressure coming from their town manager to take control of the CPA program. Um, and we're going to advise them on what we know and, and you know, um, give them the ammunition they need. So I'm very concerned about that. Um, I'm seeing it more and more. And it's because times are really tough for municipalities. I don't blame them. You know, there's no municipalities that have a lot of extra money hanging around right now. It's tough out there. And, and it's even tougher to keep employees. I'm seeing tremendous turnover in staff at cities and towns. I don't know, Sarah, if you've had a lot of turnover in Northampton, you probably are a lot more stable than other communities, but smaller communities in particular, I'm seeing tremendous turnover in staff. Um, so it's a tough time to be a municipality um, and I can't blame them. Um, but formally banding together, we have such a great relationship with the Mass Municipal Association you know, if they were going to try to change the legislation to do something like that, MMA would be their mouthpiece. MMA would not do that. They're really supportive of CPA. Um, does that answer your second question? Yes, thank you. Are you are you seeing that a little bit in Northampton? Are you a little concerned about that? I am concerned about that locally, yeah. yes. Yeah. I think, Stuart, what we are tending to see is a number of our municipal buildings are also historic structures. And they're coming to us for 
historic preservation monies. Um, and it's this sort of push and pull. Is this deferred maintenance? Um, why are we why are we seeing this and shouldn't this be part of the regular budget? And that's what we're that's what we're struggling with. Yeah. Even when it, I will it, I will tell you it, every oh sorry, sorry. Even when it's clearly is historic preservation, but there's a um a concern on the part of committee members as to as to why we're seeing this and why is it it, it isn't showing up somewhere. Right. So I, I haven't done a survey on this question, but I can guarantee you I have 196 communities that are facing the exact same thing. Municipalities, I don't know of any of them that are really good at maintaining their buildings, historic or non-historic schools. Municipalities are terrible at maintaining their assets. They just don't have the funding or the staff to do it. Um, and so, you know, that's a natural thing, you know, um, to skimp on that. And of course, you know, you defer maintenance long enough and then all of a sudden it becomes a big capital project and someone, the light bulb goes off and someone says, oh, well, CPA could do that, you know? Um, so um, it is true that CPA can't pay for maintenance, but if you defer maintenance long enough, it becomes a, a major capital project and CPA can pay for that. And that is true. Is there someone out there in a municipality who's saying, let's not do maintenance on this building for five years and then we can apply for CPA money and let it fall apart? I don't think that's happening. I think likely what's happening is they're stressed and it gets to be crazy time before the budget is finalized and cuts have to be made because things aren't coming out and maintenance often gets deferred in those cases. But I don't think it's deliberate on the part of municipalities to do that. Um, but we're seeing the same thing everywhere. As a matter of fact, it's always been that way. I don't think it's, that is any worse now. Um, you know, the, the historic building maintenance issue. Um, you know, I just encourage CPCs to be very clear about what is clearly maintenance, right? And, and not to give any wiggle room on that. Um, deferred maintenance becoming a capital thing, um, that's really a local decision you know, as to how you, how you feel about that. And I say it really is a case by case basis, you know, how important is this building? How significant it is? How much use does it get? What are the other competing applications that cycle that, you know, you'd have to take money from because you can't fund everything. Um, you know, is the, are they going, coming to the well for everything from CPA? You know, there's a lot of factors and I think they really have to be handled on a case by case basis. Oh, you're, you're muted, Brian. Any other questions for Stuart? I never answered Jeff's first question. Do you want me to uh, go back and... Sure, that should be real quick. I would yeah. Um, so, um, Jeff, how long have you been on the CPC? Uh, long enough to not re not know the answer to that. Okay. Um, <laughs> that's good. So I'm hoping you're, get, you're getting our newsletter. I mean, we did okay. figure out that a lot of you were not getting the newsletter last year. Um, and right. so Sarah and Brian helped us fix that. So we now, uh, everyone should be getting it. Um, although I would say, we'll say that just like everyone else, we use constant contact, you know, an email provider. And sometimes your um, email service will send that to spam sometimes. And we can't just, con we can't control that. But um when we're active on a piece of legislation, you will absolutely see action alerts from us all the time because we can't pass a piece of legislation ourselves. You know, um, you know, we had three different advocacy groups working for us when we were making that final push in 2019, you know, and then, you know, our steering committee and um, and our staff, you know, that's maybe 15 people and there's 200 legislators. Right. It's not going to happen unless we have a statewide effort. And, and that involves all the non-governmental organizations that we organize and then all the communities. Um, we can't get anything done without a massive statewide effort to do that um, and urging people to talk to their local legislators. You know, we'll, we can meet as many legislators as we can. It's not possible to meet with 200 legislators in a short amount of time when a piece of legislation is hot. So that's a huge part of what we do it does ebb and flow depending upon what we have at the state house, right? Um, so uh, the last big, huge effort was that 2019 effort. And if you go back to your email, if you've saved our coalition newsletters from 2018 and 2019, you know, um, 
you're going to see a lot of emails that we came through where we updated folks. Here's what just happened. You need now to call your state senator to get them to do this. Here's what just happened. You need now to call the conference committee. Here's what just happened. You need now to call the House. Here's what just happened. You need to write the governor. <laughs> um, you know, because the more you go into the process, the more steps you have, hurdles you have to cross. And each one of those is one of those big efforts. And sometimes we feel a little guilty that, you know, we're yet going to the well a fourth time asking everyone in the CPA world to go advocate on something. But when you're in that final stages of legislation, that's the only way you're going to get it done. Thank you. I think I think I did get an alert on the Comerford Amendment you mentioned yeah. earlier. Yep, we did send out. Um, we and did. I did. I did follow up on it. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Any other questions for Stuart? Well, thank you so much for taking your 45 minutes of your time. Oh, wait, a little bit longer than that. <laughs> um, so uh, we appreciate your expertise and you're going to bat for us and you will send us that uh, request for yep. dues. And I think we will wait to, as we sleep on this, to um, to vote that in or out in the next meeting in two Great. weeks. That probably is going to come from Chase, Brian, and I'll send it okay. to you, Sarah. And um, if you have a vice chair, we usually we send it to chair, vice chair. and, and uh, Chris Hellman is the vice chair. Okay, great. Okay. Great. All great. right. Thank well, you hey, so much. Have a good rest of the meeting. Thank you very much for, for having me tonight. And if we can ever help you with uh, technical assistance, uh, let us know. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, Scott. <clears throat> Thanks. Bye-bye. Uh, um all right well that was interesting and i think sarah we put on the agenda for the next meeting unless we feel the, that we could vote on that now maybe it makes sense to 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 for us to think about it and put it on at the start of next meeting's agenda sure, and we don't have anything to vote on at this point we haven't been provided a we haven't been provided. Invoice, okay. so. good so that's that's good um can i wait, ask I'm, do we have an administrative fund for the CPC? We do. Work? So uh, we put $75,000 into the administrative fund each year. That is far, far less than the 5% maximum that we're able to put into that. But we want to keep as much as possible available for projects. Um, we don't spend anywhere close to the 75000 It's mostly just to in, in case something unforeseen happened. Um, so yes, we would be able to pull it from that, which, which okay. we've done in the past. This is the first time that we didn't pay it. And it, it wasn't that the committee decided not to pay it. It was just like, hey, we'd like some more information before we take action on this. And this was the first time that we were able to set up a meeting. Uh, Lemmy? I just have a quick question. Is any of that administrative fund go towards funding you, Sarah? Like, it's just a curiosity. <laughs> Sorry. But... It, it does, yes. So okay. it's um, it goes yeah. towards staff costs. Um, Thing like printer cartridges and you know administrative stuff like that, uh, newspaper ads, the the well, thank you Northampton um, CPA funds at work signs, um, and various smaller items. Good to hear. Glad we're paying for you ourselves. <laughs> so we'll put that on our agenda for October the sixteenth. Uh, any other comments, thoughts that people want to share at this point, Jeff? Just real quick, um, my my memory the first time, uh, 2018, was I, I think we were getting this annual request for dues. And at the time, the committee in general was like, what do they do? Who are these people? We never hear from them. That's where all this generated from. We would just get a um, an annual dues um, invoice. So I think that's where all this started and and um then we have regular contact now um I, my memory is we did not have that before but um correct me if i'm wrong that's my memory as well yeah we uh in so in 20 spring 2018 the the committee decided to pay a thousand dollars rather than the 4350 that it was invoiced, um, and i I didn't want to I didn't want to say it during the meeting in case I was incorrect, but I I don't believe they returned the the money. The, we just weren't considered a, a member of the CPA coalition. 
Good to know. Any other comments? I just want to thank Jeff for um, asking the question regarding municipal buildings. I didn't think to ask it, and I um, um, Scott may have just earned his may have just earned his dues with the information he provided on that one. So I I really appreciate the the question, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, Jeff. Good to remember that, Stuart. Not Scott. Right, my bad. Yeah. <laughs> uh, any other comments? Uh, okay, quick financial overview, Sarah. I don't know if anybody had a chance to look at um, the financial spreadsheet that I put together. I'll share it just in case. Share, no, that's the wrong button. Um, Uh, bottom line is we have just under two million available uh, for project expenditures over the entire fiscal year. Um, so location of available funds, we have 1.2 million plus in the budget of reserves, so that can be spent on anything. Um, open space reserve is a little higher than the other two reserve accounts because of project funds that were returned um, during the last fiscal year from a project that didn't need them all. And th since those have to go back to the account that they were originally taken from. Um, so, and yeah, and here's the, the 75,000 in administrative funds. Um, so the carryover from last fiscal year was just over $100,000. This was a little bit lower last year because I was a little risky. It, it made DOR a little grumpy that I was, that we uh, estimated our, our state match a little higher than um, the original numbers, but we actually ended up being pretty much right in the nose with that. So we didn't have quite as much in that, you know, here's some extra money that you got from DOR bucket, but you can't spend it until next year. So that's why that number is a little bit lower. I'm hopeful that given, you know, given all of the things that Seward has just told us about um, registry of deeds receipts and uh, advocacy for additional budget funds that we, we might see a little bit more than the $306,000 that we were initially anticipating from the state, but if not, um, it'll be just under 2 million. And the breakdown of what was, oh no, my computer's not happy. Uh, the breakdown of what was submitted for this funding round is just over 1.3 million. Uh, and there were a number of applications that didn't end up being submitted, although eligibility forms had been received. And that was I, due to timing on the, the end of those projects and um, in, thinking about how to proceed with a couple of them. Like there's no municipal building applications this round, although they did let us know that that would probably come in next round. There's also no conservation projects. So that's um, although I, I definitely would anticipate seeing at least one of those for the spring funding round. Right. Um, just sorry to interrupt. Um, when we begin to talk, if if Sarah, if you could um, just ballpark the outstanding ones that you think are in the pipeline, um, that would be useful. Because uh, just back of the envelope, um, if we were to fund everything, we'd end up with about five hundred and seventy thousand unspent um, in the in the first part of this year. So <clears throat> it'd be good to know um, what we might be on the hook for. Um, during the latter part of the year. Okay. Yeah, I can work on that. Um, some of them were really complications <laughs> with the timelines for other grant funding sources. Like I know Valley CDC was um, initially planning to apply for additional funds for the Crafts Avenue affordable housing project, but they know that they won't be applying for federal funds until um, next fall. So it's just a matter of when that actual application is due and what they need to have in hand at that point. So some of them might be unknown, but I can try and get you some better numbers. Yeah, any, anything would be great. Sorry. Yep, thank you. <clears throat> and correct me if I'm wrong, Sarah, that Crafts Avenue Valley CDC proposal could be a significant one. Is that fair to say? Uh, they. So I, we funded it last round for... Um, 
So they came in with a funding request for 200,000 and that's what they needed to make some of some pending applications work at that point. I think they had at least another 400,000 that they were planning to apply for potentially a little bit more. And they were just trying to figure out how to make that work without depleting CPA funds and just having that unnecessarily sitting in, in an account that everyone knew couldn't be used later. So they, they might be able to stretch that until a year from now, uh, but they weren't quite sure. Uh, other questions for Sarah regarding the um, financial uh, overview? Yeah, uh, I have a question I should probably know the answer to, but um, so forgive me. So I saw, Sarah, that you had a, there's a bucket for open space, but not a bucket for recreation. Are those one and the same? Or are they, they are. So, okay. uh, we, you know, when we tally how much we're spending on each type of project, we do separate out recreation from open space, but the way that the CPA enabling legislation is written, the set-asides are only required for open space and recreation combined. Uh, so we don't have to do a, a separate uh, account for the recreation projects. So why do we separate them on our- It's more, it's, it's tracking. Account. I mean, open space and recreation projects are written very separately in chapter 40B. They're very different types of projects, um, but um, the, sort of the quirks of 40B lump them together just for financial purposes. Okay, thanks. Does that answer your question, Chris? Yeah. Great. Any other questions for Sarah in the financial picture for the upcoming fiscal year? Any other business not foreseen when the agenda was published? All right, so our next meeting is the 4th, 16th of October. We will be uh, hearing from about half of the applicants. Is that right, Sarah? We can't get the whole thing. Uh, As, correct. Uh, I mean, does everyone agree that it wouldn't make sense to try and jam all of these into one meeting and the two would be better? Yes, okay. particularly on the, on the 16th, if we'll be voting on the uh, preservation plan, which which may be quickie, but we may have some input on, as well as a follow-up discussion and voting on the um, funding the statewide coalition. Those Make sure to add those two things onto the list, please. Great. Uh, Martha? Um, Sarah, you just confirm you would like questions to applicants by the 9th? Yes. Uh, and I'll send out a reminder to everybody, so a week from today, if possible. It's not a it's not a hard deadline. Everybody needs deadlines to to get things done. Thank you for reminding us, Martha. So questions to Sarah that can go to the applicants before they meet with us is helpful for all of us. I think Lemmy. Sorry, I know it's late. Um, do applicants have like equal time? Because I I just remember last time there was like some applicants that went into great detail and some, and it, you know it just favors like professionalism like people who have paid professionals working on the project versus not so I'm just curious about it we don't have to address it for this round but I keep forgetting to ask you about it so yeah I'd, so I guess it's up to the discretion of the the committee I mean in the in the past especially when we had a, a lot of applications that were competing at that point for a really limited bucket of funds we set like 25 minutes and then you know when the 25 minutes is done we're going to move on to the next application but since then, it seemed like you know some of the applications need a little bit more discussion and back and forth with the applicant. So the committee's been a little looser with um, how much time is spent on each. So, but but it's totally up to you. It, we I don't feel like changing it now. I'm just curious about the history of it because, yeah, at some point I could see it being an issue, but it doesn't feel like one now. We should have code words that we share only with each other that we use. If a applicant is going on far too long, people can say the code word. We can say, okay, thank you very I, much. I do always tell applicants brief presentation. Um, it, I don't give time guidelines, but I, if people would prefer, I could say like no more than what whatever time feels appropriate, 10 minutes. I think 10 is, is, too, is too little. Um, 
I think that I, I think in the past we've kept it open and it's worked really well with a, with a couple of exceptions, uh, and uh, and those tended to go on and on and on. And we can um, try to move move those along if people are feeling restless or that we have enough information from them. Um, but if we have four, we have eight total applicants. If we do uh, twenty minutes on each, that's twenty, forty, sixty, eighty minutes. So that's an hour and 20 and with our other business that theoretically gets us with a little going over, gets us out of here in two hours, which I think most of us are appreciative of. That works for you, Lemmy? Great. Any other questions? Any other business not foreseen? Okay, so again, Martha, thank you for reminding us. Questions to Sarah by the 9th which is a week from today that she can get to applicants. Um, and otherwise we will see you on the 16th. And hopefully by then we'll have a chance to review the, uh, the CPC plan as well and be voting on that as well. All right, uh, is motion to adjourn. Uh, thank you, Kevin. A second, Jeff. Do we vote on this, Sarah? No. no. No, we just are all thumbs up. I think that's good enough, right? Yeah. <laughs> all right. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody.